Hi, hello, and welcome to this episode of Fandom Frenzy with Flash, which is of course me, uh, in which I lose my absolute <laughs> over what happened on this week's episode of Game of Thrones. So first and foremost, uh, this is the first time I've watched the show and not had any idea what's going on. So I'm like essentially running blind here. And while I'm kind of pissed off because George R. R. Martin is like the first author ever to spoil his own story because he's a stubborn old <coughs> I'm also kind of enjoying not knowing what's gonna come next, like sort of. Mostly I think I just miss watching Game of Thrones with other people and being able to watch them be horrified and be like, ha mother <coughs> I totally knew that was gonna happen. We begin the episode with Jon Snow looking dead as which you may remember is exactly how we ended last season. Like we get it, HBO, you want us to think he's dead. Look at all the blood, look at the blank stare, like clearly dead as a doornail, except that this is the wall and dead is never exactly the end of things, whether that be for, you know, like better or worse or whatever. But at this point, all I'm really hoping for is that Melisandre will finally get off her fiery red ass and actually do something for once in her life. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that later. Also, I assume there would be some sort of mutiny that occurs here, but Alistair Thorne doesn't even try to hide the fact that he killed the <laughs> out of the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, which is <laughs> treason, by the way. He's all like, yeah, I did it. So what? Jon Snow was going to destroy the Night's Watch. And Ollie, that little <laughs> just stands there like a little Ramsay Snow in training. And I don't give a <laughs> if wildlings killed your entire family. You just helped murder the future king of Westeros. What you gotta say, Ollie? We spend the rest of the episode catching up with the rest of the cast of thousands, literally worldwide, and getting probably about five minutes of actual storyline between all of the sweeping establishing shots. And I'm not complaining, I'm just like a content obsessed impatient. Oh. Seeing as I mentioned Ramsay Snow, uh, that bag of <laughs> earlier, let's get to that. He's actually mourning the loss of someone, which is the only shred of emotion we've ever seen him emote. And then he has her fed to the dog, so it's whatever. As we've last seen Sansa and Theon jumping to their impending doom in a <laughs> snowdrift, which would have had to have been so deep to not kill them, by the way, that they wouldn't have been able to dig themselves back out of it. But anyway, we then pick up the chase scene featuring Ramsay's bloodthirsty, human flesh-fed hounds, uh, and Theon urges Sansa to cross this icy river so the dogs won't catch their scent or something, and then Sansa literally says that she'll die if she has to do that, and then she does it anyway, and guess what? She doesn't die. I will say, as a side note, I had to defend Sansa as a character here to the room of people I was watching this with, because she's arguably one of my top three favorite characters in this series, and I don't think that anyone knows how much they should appreciate her character development. She takes a much different path in the books than the one that she's on now, yet it's not any less traumatizing, and she becomes every bit as manipulative and cunning as Littlefinger, and it's absolutely astounding. Anyway, crossing the river doesn't throw the hounds off. Theon gets his groove back, my precious baby Bree Bree saves the day, and I swore loudly at the television and threatened the life of the writers if anyone laid a hand on my pumpkin pod. <sighs> and now I wanna talk about something that happened that I wasn't really expecting, and this is just because I'm very prejudiced against this character as a whole. Like, I had completely forgotten that Marcella died last season for like the second time. Like, my mind just doesn't wanna to come to terms with it, I guess, because I'm like, Joffrey, Marcella's a little ray sunshine, and she dies, like right after Jamie Lannister finally tells her that he's her father. Anyway, this results in one of the most honest, and touching scenes I've not only seen in Game of Thrones, but also on television in general. Like Cersei gets so excited when she hears that a ship's in port because she thinks that she's gonna see her daughter. And then my stomach completely <laughs> dropped because it's the first time I've considered that Cersei still has no idea. Like she has no way of, of knowing at all. And I have to give all of the props to Lena Headey because she nails this scene, just absolutely <laughs> nails it. And she tells Jamie about the prophecy she received when she was young by Maggie the Frog and the prophecy re she received from Jamie. And in this scene, you actually see Jamie for what he is for the first time. 
and that's a grieving father because he's never actually been able to show that before. So Jamie gives this really great speech where he's like, fuck the prophecy, fuck that, and fuck everyone that isn't us. They did completely disregard Tommen as a person in this scene though. Like, for real. He's their only living child. They didn't even fucking mention him. So these two actors, man, like, I'm gonna burn in for this because for the first time this whole series, I totally shipped them. I mean, like the Targaryens did it, and I think that in the end, like after all these horrible things I've wished for Cersei, I still want her to get her own shot at happiness, and there's one thing that can be said about this woman, and that's that she loves her children unconditionally. And I've always liked Jamie, like literally always. I kind of wish he would acknowledge that he's in love with Brienne of Tarth because who isn't, but, it, but it's whatever. Also, Marjorie is still being held captive until she confesses by the high sparrow, but to her credit, that little fox, it doesn't look like she'll be held for long. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised they even put her in the episode, but uh, she's gonna raise some in King's Landing and the Red Keep when she's out. The Sand Snakes kill the out of the King of Dorne, Dorne Martell. And then they killed Tristane, Prince of Dorne. And then for the next half of the episode, we take a jaunty little trot across the narrow sea to catch up with our good friends Tyrion and Daenerys. Tyrion's trying to rule Marine until Danny gets back and Varys is going to help, maybe? Arya's still blind and basically helpless. I'm gonna say this right now because I think it's as good a place as any. I've never enjoyed Arya Stark. She has the most the third most chapters in the book, and I've hated every single one of them more than the last. Like in the show, they've made her this tiny, bloodthirsty little psychopath, which is basically true in the books, but the show hasn't ever truly captured how much she whines. Until now, uh, now that she's blind, so show Arya isn't doing it for me anymore either. Danny's being herded around like a slave by some Dothraki blood riders, and then lays the smack down on their cow after his wives tried to have her beheaded, which is to be expected. Like, she's a beautiful woman, and if someone randomly brought some beautiful woman to my significant other and offered her up on a platter, I'd probably do the same thing. But then they realize that she's Drogo's widow, and the wives are stoked, because that means that she has to go like, live in the Dothraki capital for the rest of her days with the rest of the widows, but it's totally gonna be okay because that old bear and the guy that is supposed to have green hair for the record, but doesn't, are on their way and totally picking up clues like needles in a haystack. We end the episode back at Castle Black and I've been saying all this time that Melisandre can finally make herself useful and try to, I don't know, bring back Jon Snow to be the true Azor High. because when was the last time we saw Beric Dondarrion? Who better to fight the Great Other than Jon Snow? Isn't that what we've been setting up for? We've witnessed that red priests and priestesses can bring back the dead before, like that isn't a far-fetched theory. Then he'll be one of the three dragon riders like, just watch, okay? Also Tyrion, who's probably a Targaryen, but I don't wanna get to that right now. Anyway, Melisandre doesn't do except take off her shiny red necklace, which is apparently the source of all of her powers because she's a grown, what the Then she lays down in bed like she's gonna try to die in her sleep. Like, does she take off the necklace every night? Like, is this usual? Or is she intentionally taking it off because she's a terrible person and wants to die. Like, you can redeem yourself, Melisandre. Bring Jon Snow back. Everyone knows you're going to. I would like to point out, just like I called before in my last Game of Thrones video, Melisandre totally got her boobs out. So Game of Thrones, uh, HBO doesn't have to pay $500 in fees. It's Game of Thrones. We don't see her boobs once per episode. We get fined like $500 or something. Boobs. That's all the that happened. Thanks for revisiting it with me and listening to my crackpot theories. If you also have some theories, leave them in the comments section below. If you thought that this rant was worth a watch, then give it a like and share it with your other Game of Thrones obsessed friends. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because we're gonna be doing this every week. Also, all of our social media links can be found below in the appropriate box-like location. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of Fan and Frenzy with Flash. In the books, Arya starts off not so bad, and Sansa starts off as the worst. And then as the books go on, they just kind of like switch. So at this point, 
In the books, Sansa's a bad girl. She could probably rule King's Landing and Westeros by herself. They took a lot of Arya's weaknesses, at least to me, and put them into Sansa because they don't want Sansa to be like the baddest boss around for some reason. Because she is every bit as cruel and cunning as Cersei Lannister at this point. You could probably go toe to toe with her and win if she could ever get out of the North and back to King's Landing.